So tonight I am going to speak of the last uh, uh, part of our Dhamma talk series. That is, uh, once you attain uh, jhanas, what would you expect after that? What is there for you? <laughs> you may ask this question, you know, after all we spend so much time, energy, uh, in one place, uh, trying to attain jhana, and uh, perhaps some of you might even have attained, uh, some may still be struggling, and those who have never attained it uh, might wonder, this is just another speculative theory which has uh, no relevance to our life. Certainly, uh, I won't blame those people because uh, uh, it is very genuine, natural feeling. Unless you experience it, you don't know. It is just a theory. It's still uh, all right to give a chance and make some attempt. Uh, perhaps uh, <coughs> if you don't attain now, you may attain it later on, but still, don't give up. When, when we take it, take the jhanic attainment uh, at a cosmic level, or in the largest uh, uh, spectrum, uh, it can go beyond this life. That is, when one attains jhanas, even the highest jhana, called neither perception nor non-perception, even let alone the highest uh, immaterial jhana, even material fourth jhanic attainment is extremely uh, powerful and even actually most difficult let alone higher jhanas. And there is another jhana called supramundane jhanas, which we have not talked about. Perhaps um, in this talk I like to touch on that also. Uh, supramundane jhanas, um, for now I must say, even one attains the highest mundane jhanas. There are three types of jhanas. One is, uh, one type is uh, fine material jhana, another is uh, immaterial jhana, and these two, both of them are mundane jhanas. When we say mundane, there has to be something super mundane. And these super mundane jhanas. So, when you attain uh, highest mundane jhana uh, and die in jhana, in the highest level of jhana, superlative, highest degree of jhana, you may be reborn, according to Buddhist belief of free birth, you will be reborn in the highest cosmic level, highest level in samsara. That is uh, the certain uh, realms called Brahma realms. And uh, in human uh, calculation, human years, it is an uh, incalculable long, long period of time. You enjoy the bliss and peace in that state. Even that is, of course, just uh, difficult to conceive in, in our mind. But 
we believe that there is such a state of existence uh, for those who have practiced jhanas to be born. And all these uh, jhanic practice have, uh, practice are wholesome uh, practice, wholesome practice. <coughs> whether it is wholesome or unwholesome, our practice uh, will produce result. This is what we call wholesome karma. Meditation in general is wholesome karma. Even if you do not attain any jhanas, meditation practice is wholesome practice, skillful practice. Even if you do not believe in rebirth, Meditation will definitely make this life wholesome. Is that not enough? We don't worry about rebirth. This life itself will be wonderful, wholesome, peaceful and happy. But it has uh, uh, more uh, lasting results or more durable results <coughs> beyond this life. So, the duration of that peace, that bliss, that happiness in those existence depends on the kind of jhana we practice now. If we practice and attain fi uh, fine material lowest jhana, that is first jhana. One would be reborn in one of those realms for a certain period of time. When you are born there, until this jhanic effect lasts, until the jhana, the power, the ability, the efficacy, potency of this jhana exists, you will be there. When that is over, you, you spend that time there, use up your karma there, and then may come back to human level. And human life, again, you may either practice jhana or do not practice jhana. You even don't remember, perhaps, because the 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 power of jhanic power you have you have already spent. The what you have invested is already spent. Now you come back empty-handed, so you have to start everything all over again. Not necessarily. There will certainly be some benefit being in such a wonderful place for so many, maybe an eon, uh, even if you come back without anything with you, still you will be, you will be having a better human life. And that doesn't guarantee that you will practice meditation, and you will continue to be a good human being all the time, no guarantee. Perhaps because of a kind of orientation, conditioning, things you have learned and done here, there is possibility that you might be reborn in a lower plane of existence, much lower than human plane. And then again you work your way up again very hard. And then you may go up, come down, up, down in a roller coaster. You see? So go round and round and round and round and round. Merry go round. And that is one danger in attaining fine material jhana, or even immaterial jhana. 
Why is it so? Because that attainment, as you have already noticed, once you attain even the first jhana, it is so blissful, so peaceful, you do not feel like coming out of it. Even if you attain for ten minutes, during these ten minutes you feel immortal. You don't want to come out of it. And that is an attachment. Very. It is uh, not sensual pleasure. It has nothing to do with the external world. You developed it, cultivated it from within yourself, because you have the potential, you have the power in within you, and you uh, explored this potential and uh, discovered this and attain it within yourself. And you are attached to that attainment. Although it is within yourself, you are attached to this feeling. And therefore, uh, you don't want to give it up. That is one danger that many meditators, uh, you know, Vipassana meditators, emphasize. They say, if you attain jhana, you get attached to it, you will not come out of it. That is also possible. And one would say, why do we need anything else in this life? I don't want anything else. This is so blissful and peaceful, I want to stay with that. Unfortunately, friends, that does not guarantee our future freedom from suffering, future bliss. As long as you are in that blissful state of jhana, you are already happy. But once you lose it, you are just like anybody else, with some uh, good feeling, good results. And yet uh, the, the inner um, uh, roots of problems remain. What you have done by attaining jhanas is that you have uh, cut out those bamboo shoots, you know, like thing, the, the, the superficial, uh, overground, uh, the little shoots, but underground, large quality, um, quantity of roots are, are all these spread underground. You don't see them. When you cut them off for a two days, three days, four days, you see there are no bamboo shoots. <laughs> the place is clean. And wait for another week, and you will see a shoot coming out. <laughs> you, we have seen that, right? So. Uh, similarly, when we attain jhana during that period, our hindrances will be suppressed. But the hindrances are hindrances are hindrances are like those little shoots of bamboo, bamboo shoots. But they are coming from their roots, and roots are they are spread all over like cancer, everywhere. So, the Buddha's advice is, use this jhana, the same thing, because when you attain jhana, the, the, even the first one, you, are, you have certain degree of mindfulness, concentration, wisdom, uh, equanimity, and so forth. And if you keep practicing, when you go to the fourth jhana, as we mentioned yesterday, 
uh, mindfulness becomes pure, uh, concentration becomes strong, equanimity is the clearest, the strongest, and Buddha said, use that to delve right into the depth of the roots of our, um, what you call, defilements, out of which these hindrances keep arising. So, with that sharp, pure, strong, one-pointedness of mind, wholesome one-pointedness of mind, with that pure mindfulness, with the strong, powerful equanimity, pay attention to things that are within us. As I mentioned last evening, uh, sometimes people might wonder, how can we do that? How can we focus concentrated attention on something without thinking? Uh, so some uh, especially comment commentaries uh, uh, say, uh, you must come out of jhanic experience and use the mind to focus on various defilements. Such as uh, the notion of uh, self, notion of self is one of the uh, defilements. We may call it in English uh, either self or soul or ego. Perhaps there may, have, may be some uh, differences in these terms, but uh, in Pali we use only one word, atta. What we, uh, in order to see atta or self, in order to see self, where do we look at? Where do we find it? Where is self? So with the uh, uh, concentrated mind, uh, the atten our attention uh, focuses or divert or direct our concentrated mind to see this particular notion. Not thinking that I'm going to look at this particular notion, but look at ourselves, with, not with eyes, not with thoughts. Uh, when we when we look at something with thoughts, what we do is what we do when we th when we look at something with thoughts. Now we have enough of that. We have been thinking, talking, writing, logically, rationally, uh, what this self is. We talk about self. There may not be any other single word that has been so much explored, written about, uh, the volumes and volumes of book, as this notion of self and God. And yet, they all are limited to words. Now when this, when we cultivate mindfulness and gain deep, concentrated, uh, one-pointed uh, mind, 
at that level, at that mind, we don't use to think about self. We use words to think when we do not have concentration. When we have this deep concentration, our attention direct that concentration in, into, into our uh, body, feeling, perceptions, thoughts and consciousness. And they also are not words. Body is not a word. Uh, feeling is not word and so forth. Except thoughts. Thoughts are words. When we focus the mind, starting with the body, this concentrated mind, when we focus on the body, these are what we call five aggregates, these are the material that we explore, investigate, that we, we dig into, into to find out what they are. So we focus our mind on, for instance, one of these aggregates, called cell or the body, and do, what do we find in the body? Not words, not thoughts, uh, but what we call some material. They are not words and thoughts. We find material, solid material, liquid material, heat and air. This concentrated mind focuses on uh, so-called solid material. We call, we, as you all know, we call it uh, earth element. When we focus concentrated mind on earth element, earth element is not a word, not a concept, but it is a matter which also is not one single uh, tangible entity, but a matter made up of many trillions of minute particles. Earth element is an element uh, which in its which itself is not one single solid big object, but uh, made up of a very minute tiny little particles. And these particles, when we focus our mind on, are also uh, breakable. When we break them, when we focus mind directly on this, what we see is not some uh, uh, tangible entity, but waves. They are like waves. They can break down to sub atomic level. Now this function or this uh, uh, breaking down to the minutest subatomic level uh, is uh, possible only when we when the mind is fully concentrated. It is the concentrated mind that sees the body in this uh, minutest level, the sub-atomic level. At that time, when ev what we see there is that all these sub-minute, sub-atomic level waves are always dancing in a state of flux, changing, moving, all the time, arising, 
passing away, arising, coming to peak and passing away. They are always arising and always passing away. We don't see that with unconcentrated mind. What we know with unconcentrated mind is speculative, rational, logical the thought. We rationally we think, as I mentioned yesterday, since the uh, impermanence uh, has left uh, scars, the marks, the footsteps, uh, the footprints of impermanence uh, are left. From that we know things have changed. But when, it, when the change is taking place, <coughs> we don't see them. But with the concentrated mind, without using any words, that is why, you know, even in medita inside meditation we, we uh, ask people not to use words to experience things. To experience the bodily uh, function in its fundamental, rudimentary, basic level, we don't choose words. We just focus this concentrated mind. And then what happens, since everything is breaking down, everything is appearing, coming to peak, and passing away in a split second, all this happened in th these three things can happen in a split second. Appearing, coming to peak, and passing away. All these three happens in a split second. Average unconcentrated unconcentrated mind cannot see them changing at that speed. But a concentrated mind can see uh, all this because it is extremely powerful. This is what is called samadhi bala. Samadhi bala, the strength of concentration. And therefore, our notion, we have a notion of self. <coughs> what is the uh, notion of self, uh, uh, there are twenty types of notions of self. That is, we generally think, uh, ordinary in day-to-day -day life when we talk, talk um, we behave, we do various things, we don't say these things, but when we think, discuss, we will uh, uh, always have these notions of self. We think uh, the body is self. Therefore, it is called Sakkaya Ditti in Pali. View that the body is self. Or there is a notion that self is in the body. First, we, we identify the body and self as one. Or we think the body is in self. Or self is in the body. Or body and self are separate. Four possibilities. Four possibilities. Similarly, for feelings, four possibilities. Perception, four, four possibilities. Thoughts, four possibilities and consciousness for possibilities. When we take all these possibilities together, there will be twenty different possible ways of thinking of self. Why we do that? Because we do we 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 think, we talk about it uh, logically, rationally and so forth without having one-pointed, concentrated mind. Without one-pointed, concentrated, without focusing one-pointed, concentrated mind, we just talk about it. 
and therefore we do not see this reality. When the mind is fully concentrated, it is that concentrated mind which can penetrate all these superficial barriers and go into the very bottom of the body. Feelings, perceptions, thoughts and consciousness. And then there arise insight in us that this self is an illusion. This notion of self is just an illusion. When we see the notion of self is an illusion, then we experience enormous amount of relief. As long as we do not see that, we feel always very rigid, uptight, proud and uh, very uncomfortable. We get hurt, we get insulted, we get angry. Anytime if somebody says something to hurt us, something, somebody does something to hurt us, we get upset, angry, disappointed. And we say, he hurt me, he insulted me, he hurt my dignity, my honour, my respect. And I get very upset. But when I see this non-existence of self, it doesn't matter to me what other people say to me. Nothing will hurt me. Nothing will irritate me. Why? In reality there is nothing for me to hold on to. It is just a notion. Otherwise, every day, I would experience great deal of pain from indignation, from insult, accusation, and getting angry. Uh, I feel jealous. I will have fear. Fear of death, fear of losing myself, all kind of fears. I will have greed, I have greed because of this self. All kind of irritations, all kind of uh, uh, defilements arise from this root called notion of self. But when we have this deep, powerful, concentrated mind and use it to see the body, feeling, perception, thoughts and consciousness, and then we see that they don't have anything permanent, anything substantial. Everything is in, in this state of flux, changing all the time. Then the notion of self will disappear. This is one thing that happened when we use the concentrated mind to remove one of the roots of problems. One of the major roots of our problems is the notion of self. And along with that root, greed is settled down hatred is settled down, and delusion is settled down. So along with that there is greed, hatred and delusion, three unwholesome roots. At the moment we manage to see 
uh, this uh, root of selflessness in reality, that very moment concentration, average ordinary one-pointed mundane concentration turns into supra-mundane concentration. Because it takes supra-mundane level, supra-mundane understanding in order to uproot this uh, notion of self, and therefore that state is called supramandin jhana. Supramandin jhana. At that moment, our insight becomes supramandin insight. Jhana becomes supramandin jhana. I mentioned at the beginning there are three types of jhanas. One is uh, material jhana, other is immaterial jhana, both are called mundane jhanas, and the other one is called supramundane jhana. <coughs> Some meditators say, we don't need jhanas at all to attain supramundane attainment. Like, the, what I described was one part of the attainment of stream entry. And this attainment is called attainment of stream entry. It has three parts. This is one part. Uh, so they say we don't need concentration to attain supramandian uh, stream entry. All we need is vipassana. But they all admit uh, unanimously that even though they do not practice jhanic meditation, when they attain the supramundane level, they attain it at the supramundane jhanic, uh, jhanic quality, at the supramundane jhanic quality. Why it is called supramundane? Because this understanding, this realization does not belong to mundane knowledge, mundane understanding. This is supra mundane understanding. Mundane understanding remains uh, as mundane until we reach this level of stream entry. Then Along with that, this is the most difficult, uh, what you call deeply rooted uh, defilements uh, to overcome, most difficult one. This is most difficult because uh, uh, there are countless reasons people come up with to substantiate, to support it, to nourish this root of self. This doesn't belong to one particular geographical area. Some people say, oh, Western people think about it, self. Eastern people don't have it. Nonsense. There is no difference between West and East with regard to this notion. All of them alike uphold this notion from time immemorial. But Buddha was so brave, so insightful. Once he realized this, he came out and declared publicly, without any hesitation, there's no self. It is like uh, stabbing, you know, right <laughs> into the heart. Uh, Without any hesitation, he said that. And even up to this date, after almost 2,600 years after his passing away, still people are struggling with this, with this particular attainment, with particular teaching. And only those fortunate ones, lucky ones, who meditate and gain this concentrated meditation combined with vipassana 
are fortunate to see this exactly as it is. And they are the ones who live from that point onward with the relax, completely relaxed, completely trouble-free uh, life. Troubles are there, but they won't be bothered by the troubles. This is the most difficult one. Second is uh, doubts. When we see the reality of impermanence, reality of selflessness, reality of unsatisfactoriness, our doubt fades away. Doubt regarding what? Doubt regarding ourselves, doubt regarding the, uh, the teaching, doubt with regard to the practice, doubt with regard to the Buddha's own attainment, doubt with regard to what he said with regard to self, all these doubts will disappear when we see impermanence at the root level. That when we penetrate impermanence exactly as it is. So long as we have doubt, we may have faith. Along with the doubt, we can have faith. One time we have faith, next time we have doubt. And this go back and forth. And so long as we have doubt, things are always confusing. And sometimes we accept, sometimes we reject. Sometimes we think, well, it, is, uh, it seems to be working, sometimes we think it doesn't work for me at all. That kind of uh, ups and downs uh, will uh, happen to us when we have doubts. When we come, overcome doubts and remove doubts by seeing this reality of impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and selflessness, then now doubt will fade away. How can we see uh, uh, impermanence? We can see when we focus our mind on it. How can we see unsatisfactoriness with concentrated mind. Anybody can know un as unsatisfactory, even without concentrated mind. Unsatisfactoriness means suffering. Any average person can feel suffering. Does a person, average person, need any deep concentration to understand suffering? We may, one may think, no. One does not need too deep concentration to understand suffering, because we experience it every day. But friends, what we, the suffering we experience every day, actually speaking, is very superficial kind of suffering. If we understand suffering and see suffering in a the most uh, the fundamental way at its roots, then we, we uh, do not have suffering anymore. When we have deep concentrated mind, we see the connection between our greed and suffering. We become attached to impermanent things, thinking that it is permanent. When we see impermanence exactly as it is, then there will not be an attachment to anything that, anything in life, including life itself. Even that is, that also is not very easy, very difficult thing, not to have attachment. Not to have attachment is extremely difficult, as difficult or even more difficult than 
not having the notion of self. Some may say, I don't believe in the self, but I want this. I like this. How can I live without that? So attachment or clinging, craving is even more difficult to get rid of without seeing impermanence exactly as it is. So when we see impermanence very clearly, then we see there is nothing to attach. All union ends in separation. All pleasure ends in pain. All joy ends in pain. So long as we do not see impermanence. When we see impermanence, that knowledge of impermanence itself is a pleasure. It's a joy, it's a happiness. Then we don't cling to it. We don't cling to it and we let it go. And the third thing is the uh, belief in uh, attaining this supramundane level or attaining liberation from suffering by following rites and rituals. One may think if one uh, practice certain rituals every day, see um, prostrating to the Buddha, Buddha statue, hundred times a day or two hundred times at a time, one might think that might liberate myself from suffering. So one might do that. Or one might pay, uh, put flowers on the altar, hundred thousand flowers every day, thinking that that would liberate himself from suffering. Or light candles, uh, 284,000 candles. In, uh, in some countries like Sri Lanka, there is a, a light offering ritual. 84,000 lamps. They make small earthen lamps, 84,000, and burn the whole area. All whole area is in blaze, a blessed flame, generating a lot of heat. You cannot go 10 yards close to that. So hot. That is a kind of ritual. And they bring water, milk, <coughs> and bathe trees, like a bodhi tree. They bathe bodhi tree with milk. And eventually they kill it because a uh, worm will <laughs> grow there and eat the tree, roots of the tree and they kill it. And still they believe that would liberate them from suffering. And if we look, at, look around, the amount of ignorance that people have to believe that rituals and rites and rituals will liberate themselves and the amount of rites and rituals they perform to be liberated from suffering, I mean you can, you will be really shocked if you go around the world in uh, any religious tradition, not only Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jews, you take it, any religious tradition. All they do, all we do, believing that all this will liberate us from suffering. And Buddha said, all these are totally nonsensical, nonsense, useless. They would not liberate us from suffering. And yet, how can we get rid of them? We cannot live with them. When we have a deep, powerful meditative state or concentrated meditation or mindfulness meditation and both combine together, 
and use this insight and concentration to see these rituals exactly as they are, what they do to us, we can easily do away with them. We can easily live without them. But that is also very difficult. Now, you see, these are, the, these are three of the ten, what you call defilements. We call them fetters. They, we call them, Buddha called them fetters. Uh, some people, somebody, when I use this word, some are giving a talk. Uh, fetters. They thought uh, I was talking about a fatness, <laughs> getting fat. So I, they thought I was talking about getting rid of our fat <laughs> to make us thin, <laughs> to liberate ourselves. So when I talk about ten fetters, they, to, they thought I was talking about ten types of fatness. <laughs> it is like sort of fatty things. <laughs> so anyway, these are impediments binding factors, binding us to samsara, therefore they are called fetters. And these three are three of the ten fetters. Belief in self, belief in rituals, belief in uh, having doubts. Now, when the mind is pure, as may I mentioned yesterday in, when in, the, in the fourth jhana, Mindfulness becomes pure, and mind becomes pure, and fully concentrated. With that pure, fully concentrated, mindful state, we penetrate, we see the futility, uselessness of all these beliefs. And that liberates us to some extent. That is the first stage of liberation, first degree of liberation. Friends, we don't have to wait until all of them completely eradicated to feel liberation. Every time we see even a little bit of them and learn to chip off one tiny little bit of them, to that extent, to that degree, we feel relief. We feel happy. And therefore, when, I, when, when we ask, uh, what does it do to my daily life, we must look at this very carefully. And we must see, it does enormous amount of good to my daily life. Because of my belief in self, I always uh, am uncomfortable. If I reduce it, relax it, and do whatever I do selflessly. I feel comfortable. When I do something with notion of self, I always expect something. At least thank. When I give a talk, if people do not appreciate it, I feel very sad because I like them to appreciate my talk. Why? Because of myself, my ego, my attachment. If I give some meditation instructions and people say, ah, he take, I talk humbug, just nonsense, rotten, dirty thing, I don't like that. I don't like the way he talks, I don't like the instructions he gives, it doesn't work for me, it is useless. If I hear that, I feel very sad, because I do my best, <laughs> putting a lot of effort, and think very carefully, and with very good intention I say all these things, but this is what I get in return. <laughs> I get so disappointed. Why? Because I have ego self-attachment. If I do this, I do this very sincerely. If somebody does not understand, 
I must try to make the person understand. If the person says, Bande, what you said is nonsense, I don't understand at all, I like to sit down, if I sit down with that person and say, which part you didn't understand? Help me how to help you. If I do that, then I don't feel sad, uh, I don't feel disappointed. If I cannot do that and I get angry, that means I am full of ego. So, now just look at it from a very practical point of view, practical way, when we look at it, we can see immediate benefit of even having a little bit of understanding of this selflessness. So, when you look at the large picture, you can see the amount of joy, relief, comfort, pleasure and total freedom we will have when we liberate ourselves from all these fetters. Now, this first level of attainment of supramundane level doesn't happen automatically through the practice of vipassana meditation, concentration meditation, we see the reality, only then can these three fetters will be removed from our mind. And, and yet, Buddha said, this is the most difficult attainment. Most difficult attainment. And he gave an, a beautiful um, analogy. He said, uh, he took little dust, earth, dirt into his, uh, this uh, small uh, nail, not this side, but on this side, put little dust and showed to monks who were with him and asked, because which is greater, the dirt on my uh, fingernail or the dirt in the whole world? <laughs> they said, naturally, sir, the dirt in the whole world is so much more than this little dust on your dirt on your finger. But they say, similarly, because what you have destroyed by attaining the first level of supramundane attainment, stream entry, what you have destroyed is like this whole world, dirt in the whole world. But what you have to leave, destroy, is just like this little dust on my fingertip. So, therefore, he said, Patavya eka rajjena saggas gamanenava sabba loka adhipatjena sota patti phalang varang. Attainment of this state, stream entry, is greater than becoming a universal monarch. You know, when you become a universal monarch, you can make the whole world dance at your fingertip. You can do anything you want. And he said, it is better than even going to heaven. Because this is the most difficult attainment. So, friends, out of all these attainments, when we do this attainment, then our future is 100% guarantee. We will not go below human level, go to the other uh, realm of existence, lower than human realm. That is the most important guarantee. If we were to be reborn, the lowest we will be reborn would be human life. Not only just uh, uh, unfortunate type of human being, but very fortunate type of human being. Fortunate that we will have uh, good friends, good companions, good 
situations, happy state of mind, peaceful state of mind. Dhamma is available for us to practice. Meditation is available for us to practice. And our path would become very easy. However, if we strive hard enough in this very life, we even don't have to take rebirth. We can finish everything here and go totally free. So, that is the time when we totally are free, that is the time we remove all the roots of defilements, like removing this bamboo roots, just like putting herbicide. <laughs> this practice of vipassana inside jhana is like putting herbicide to these roots to kill them.